for the fourth meeting of the uh, Interim Joint Committee on Economic Development Workforce Investment. We have two items on our agenda today, but those are uh, good items that might lead to some good discussion. So at this time, I want to ask Sasha to please call the roll. Senator Boswell. Here. Senator Funky Frohmeyer. Present. Senator Gardler. Senator Harper Angel. Senator Howell. Senator Mills. Senator Storm. Senator Thomas. Senator Wheeler. Senator Wilson. Representative Baker. Here. Representative Bauman. Representative Branscombe. Here. Representative Bratcher. Here. Representative Calloway. Representative Elliott. Representative Gentry. Representative Hart. Here. Representative Huff. Here. Representative Jackson. Present. Representative King. Present. Representative Kokarney. Representative Lawrence. Why, yes. Representative Lockett. Here. Representative Pratt. Here. Representative Roarks. Representative Sharp. Present. Representative Tackett Lafferty. Representative Truitt. Senator Wise. Representative Weber. Present. All right, we are lacking a couple members uh, necessary for a quorum, so we will come back to approval of the minutes from the previous meeting. Uh, at this time, we're going to be doing a workforce overview, and we want to ask uh, our uh, panel to come forward on the first presentation. Michael Gritton, Myra Wilson, Dean and Dean McKay, and anyone else that will be presenting with you. Uh, if you all will uh, introduce yourself for the record, and then after you've done so, you can go ahead and begin uh, your presentation. Good morning. Uh, I apologize. Dean McKay, who is my Northern Kentucky Workforce Investment Board chair, was unable to be here. Uh, he had a, a, a work commitment, and had, which took him out of state. So my name is Corey Eimer. I'm the Northern Kentucky Workforce Investment Board director. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Myra Wilson. I'm the workforce director for the Cumberlands, the 13 counties surrounding Lake Cumberland. And thank you again for having us. Good morning. I'm Michael Gritton. I'm the Executive Director of Kentucky Anna Works, which is the Workforce Development Board for Louisville and the six counties around it, including Bullock County. All right, you all may begin in whatever order you choose. All right, again, good morning, and thank you for allowing us to be here and have this opportunity. It's the first time us as workforce directors have been in front of this committee. Behind me, we have several of our colleagues from the different workforce boards across the uh, Commonwealth. On our next slide, you will see that Kentucky has 10 workforce boards. There's one state workforce board, which is called the Kentucky Workforce Innovation Board or the KWIB, but the 10 workforce boards around the Commonwealth were commonly referred to as the Workforce Development Board, the Local Workforce Area, or maybe even your Workforce Investment Board. Seven of those 10 workforce boards are managed by the area development districts. I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, Michael Gritton. He's going to take us through some of our uh, formulas and how we receive funding from the federal government. Well, and we're just trying to make a basic introduction to you all for, of who we are and what we do. So to keep it really simple, we get money from a federal law called the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. And that law flows, the, the money flows from the federal government to each of the 50 states and from each of the 50 states each governor can keep 15% of the money and spend it on workforce pilot programs. The other 85% flows down to those 10 local workforce boards that you just saw on the map. Um, and those workforce boards are overseen by a board of directors that's required to have a majority of business people on the board. And I want to thank and acknowledge, I've got three board members, if they'll raise their hand, one from East and Westbrook Construction, one from Norton Healthcare, and one from the Chamber of Commerce in, in Oldham County who bothered to come all this way just to let you know they really care about what we do and, and want to introduce themselves to you as well. Next slide. Um, what we want to show you is, in general, workforce development has been thought of as a federal obligation, but what you'll see is the federal government is just slowly but surely disinvesting from this work. So in real terms, um, we are now getting overall almost half of what we used to get 20 years ago. It's 40, 49% down in the last two decades. 
In the next slide, you'll see that Kentucky in particular um, has seen its own share of that. So this pie is shrinking. Kentucky's share has been shrinking by 17% just over the last five years. That's good news in a way because some of the federal formulas are based on things like unemployment rates and poverty rates. So as unemployment rates have gone down, um, our share of the overall money from the federal government has gone down. But what that means is myself and the other workforce colleagues that are here simply have less money to try to solve the problems that you all are hearing about from all of your employers every day. Next, next slide. Um, in particular, one of the three funding streams that comes from that Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act is titled Youth, um, and it targets young adults. And we want you to know we've got a big problem in the Commonwealth. Roughly one out of every seven young people who are between the ages of 16 and 24 are not in school and not working. So just think about that for a minute. This is the best economy we've had in my lifetime, and I'm old, right? It's easy to get a job. Every employer is hiring, and yet one out of seven young adults across the Commonwealth is not in school and not working. Um, our, that, we call that disconnected young adults, and Kentucky's rate in that is among the bottom 10 of the 50 states. Um, and you can only imagine the many different things that have caused that to get worse in the last three years, whether it's the pandemic or other kinds of things. Next. Um, this is a map that shows you the darker the color, the higher percentage of those disconnected young adults um, are in those areas. And what you'll see is this is not a Louisville or an urban problem. It's not an Eastern Kentucky or a rural problem. It's a Commonwealth problem, right? We have disconnected young adults all across the state. Um, and uh, we do what we can with the federal money that we get, but we simply don't get enough to really try to solve this problem. Next. Um, you all are experts about this, so I will not read the slide to you, but the economic costs are very large, whether it's for that individual who isn't working, isn't getting health insurance from their employer, they're clearly um, lost and not moving forward in a positive way. Unfortunately for us, that means we end up getting lower tax revenue because they're not working, but we also end up spending money on them in lots of ways that none of us want to spend money on them because they're not doing productive things. Um, and ultimately, that ends up leading to higher poverty rates, which are obviously linked to higher crime rates as well. So these are all things you all know and, and live with here uh, every day as you make these hard decisions. Um, there was a big study in 2012 that's considered the best one that's been done about this. The taxpayer burden for each one of those disconnected young adults is about $14,000 a year. Um, and over their lifetime, they cost us all a lot of money in other ways um, that we'd like to avoid if we could turn them into productive citizens. Next slide. Um, I just wanted to give you an example. In, in the seven-county area that I oversee in Louisville and the six counties around it, Goodwill is the service provider um, who provides this service for us, and we call it the SPOT, the Young Adult Opportunity Campus. They are doing great work, and just in the last year, with federal money and also with a big investment from the city of Louisville, we're serving almost 500 of those young adults. Um, we got over 200 of them into jobs last year. That's what we're about. We're the workforce people, so we know they need help addressing barriers, but ultimately the objective is to get them into work. Next slide. Um, this is just an example of one of those people. We'll share these slides with you afterwards, so I don't want to read it, but again, Lots of kids and young adults come to us like Alvi who need help, right, overcoming barriers in their personal life, sometimes in their educational life, but we know how to help them. And when we do, we can get them going in the right direction. You can see at the bottom of the slide, she's now working full time at UPS and beginning to a college career. That is not where she was when she got to us, but that's where she is now. Let me kick it back to Myra and she can give you more examples of how this work happens every day. Uh, within our area, during the time frame between, between spring 2020 and summer 2022, we was able to help over 500 youth, which put $2.1 million into paid work experience that helped our 13 counties. That's just one of the many examples of the ways that we could reach youth if we had the ability to do more with them. Corey has a couple of testimonies from his area that he's going to share with us next. As I mentioned in the beginning, uh, my board chair, Dean McKay, sends his regrets for being an, uh, unable to attend, but he did prepare some remarks that I'm going to read on his behalf. 
Hello, my name is Dean McKay. I'm the Director of Organizational Development and Information Technology at Skillcraft and the current board chair of the Northern Kentucky Workforce Investment Board. First, I would like to thank this committee for the opportunity to share my unique experience working with the public workforce system. I became acquainted with the workforce system in 2017 when I suddenly became a dislocated worker after having spent 17 years working for the same company. I quickly realized I needed to upgrade my skills and credentials to be able to find new employment that offered a comparable salary and benefits package as the company I had worked for. It was then that I got connected with services offered through the Kentucky Career Center in Northern Kentucky. After receiving supportive coaching from multiple workforce providers within the Kentucky Career Center network, I was able to take advantage of WIOA funds, which are the federal funds that uh, Michael was talking about, to assist with paying for updating my credentials to make me more competitive in the labor market. The team of professionals through the Kentucky Career Center were exceptional and I appreciate the help they provided that positioned me for the next chapter of my professional journey. Now as a member of the executive team at Skillcraft, I work with the Kentucky Career Center team in a different capacity. The Career Center's business services team is there to support Skillcraft with attracting and re retaining the talent we need to be successful. Whether it's assisting with hiring events, identifying untapped talent pools through unconventional hiring practices, or training our incumbent workers to help our current employees stay in advance within the company, I know I can count on the Kentucky Career Center Business Services team to meet, meet Skillcraft's workforce needs. And as chair of the North Kentucky Workforce Investment Board, is, it is helpful to see the inner workings of the public workforce system and have an opportunity to play a lead role with influencing that work for the better. I have seen directly how reduced federal funds has put a strain on our local team. Realizing that it's very likely that federal funds will continue to decline, we are thinking creatively about strategies to continue our services at a high level in the face of recent and anticipated funding reductions. Lastly, since the majority of what was presented to you today involves services for our youth and young adults, I would like to share my experience the, uh, I'm sorry, share the experience my daughter Macy has had recently, which will help paint the picture of how all youth, not just those who have notable life barriers, need support from our public workforce system. Macy is 24 years old and was struggling to find a career that gave her the opportunity to be productive and provide a stable income within her personal limitations. Less restrictive workforce funding is needed to meet the needs of many of our opportunity youth who, like Macy, may have personal limitations that make a traditional college route unlikely, but can offer specialized training and certifications that opens doors to real careers. After a two-year journey through several jobs, Macy is now on what we believe to be her path. Tomorrow, she will be taking her National Pharmacy Tech Certification. Keep your fingers crossed for her. Now, that may have been two days ago, so I hope that went well. Uh, now more than ever, funding for workforce programs is critical. As an advanced manufacturing employer, we see the impact of the labor shortage every day. It's incumbent on all of us who work in the workforce development to find answers to engage these pockets of workers who can become assets to employers in the Commonwealth and continue to grow existing businesses and attract new ones. And that concludes Dean McKay's comments. Again, I appreciate the opportunity to speak today on his behalf. And I think now we're, we're uh, open to questions thank you for your uh, presentation I do appreciate that we're going to start off questions today with representative Branscom thank you chairman and thank you all for for being here today um, it's always good to see Myra she's my director in the Cumberlands area but um, looking at this uh, youth disconnection and these numbers I mean that's pretty staggering and that's our that's our future and current uh, workforce right there so I think that's uh, that's a pretty important thing that we all need to be paying attention to. Um, you mentioned a couple programs here, the SPOT and the uh, WIOA Youth. Uh, one question I have is, uh, what point do you get involved um, with the with the youth? Is that seniors or you know at what age? What point do you start trying to to uh, tackle that issue? So. Most of that money targets young people who are not in school. So we typically find them when they find us after they've gotten out and been struggling. 
We get a lot of referrals from folks who are bumping into the criminal justice system, which is much later than we'd like to be able to catch them. Um, but I think all of my workforce colleagues share the concern that that money doesn't really let us serve high school seniors very well. So all of us get asked by our high schools, can you help our seniors, particularly the kids we know might struggle and could use some extra help, right? But the money that we get from the federal government isn't really designed to do that. So we're always stuck either trying to figure out how to do something without saying too much about it or wreck it, just telling them we're not able to do it. So part of what we're interested in talking to you all about is we would love to find ways to be able to serve high school seniors very directly, particularly when they're not going on to college as a first step, and also be able to serve more of those young adults. Again, in my seven-county area, there are more than 15,000 of those young adults, and we're serving about 500, right? You saw on the map the number is 77,000 for the whole Commonwealth of Kentucky. So again, colleagues who are sitting behind me all wish they had resources to serve them more. We know how to do it. We just don't have the we don't have the resources to, to get the reach that we want. Thank you, Chairman. Representative King. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a recognition and a question, if I may. Mm -hmm. you may. <laughs> Thank you very much. I would like for Mike Riley to wave to the crowd. Mm -hmm. He is a constituent, and and I can tell you, he is a trusted resource in this space and. Many things, workforce investment. So I'm I'm thankful that you are a part of this discussion. Mm -hmm. My question uh, is regarding terminology. Um, I didn't hear you mention the phrase workforce particip participation rate. That is the metric I like to track. Is it a problem that the federal government is providing funding based on unemployment rate, which is low in Kentucky and maybe other states as well, and not tracking workforce participation rate, which I think is actually what we're trying to improve here. Can you speak to that a little bit? Thank you for the question, Representative King. Uh, workforce participation rate is something we all pay close attention to, and, and we would agree that's a, it's a more important indicator than unemployment rate because unemployment rate just measures those who are at the time receiving benefits and that once they drop off they sort of drop out of that number uh, statewide Kentucky is falling behind with workforce participation as a state we're about 58 percent it's different in each region uh, we're fortunate in northern Kentucky to have a 67 percent workforce participation rate which is higher than the national average but that it's different in every region of the state. And just um, so that everyone is, uh, has a clear understanding of how that's calculated, um, it measures everyone who is 16 years of age and up. So 99-year-olds are part of this formula. Whoever is not incarcerated, not institutionalized, and not in the military is counted if they're 16 and over. So that's the reason that you see percentages so low as 58 percent is because we're, we're capturing a lot of our older Americans too within that statistic uh, but it is something we pay close attention to and I know our local boards uh, that's one of the first metrics that we talk about at each and every board meeting can I just add one other thing Kentucky stats has put out a blog we can share it with the committee afterward the workforce participation rate in the urban areas of Kentucky basically match the national average. There's nothing unusual about them or that seems problematic from the federal level. The, the workforce participation rate in the rural parts of Kentucky, other than our Appalachian counties in eastern Kentucky, basically match the workforce participation rate of rural areas around the country. So our real challenge is in eastern Kentucky. And I know my colleague Becky Miller is here. They're doing heroic work through EKSEP, right, and other things. So there are good things happening. But all I want to make sure the committee understands is sometimes I think people have an idea that folks are at home not working and not doing anything, there isn't much evidence that that's true. Whether it's the Louisville area, Northern Kentucky, or Lexington, those big urban areas, the, the labor force participation rate basically tracks the national average. So there's nothing unusual about it. Um, what we've really got is challenges in particular areas where there just isn't an ec enough economic activity to be able to, to pull people in. May I follow up? Briefly, <laughs> thank you. Um, the biggest difference and the reason I track 
workforce participation is because with the unemployment, they aren't calculated if they aren't actively looking. Am I correct in, That's correct. in that assumption? That's correct. Okay. So they either have to be working or actively looking for work to be counted in that percentage. Otherwise, they're not in the labor force. That's correct. Okay, so going back to my original question, is it not detrimental to Kentucky and anyone actively looking that the federal funding is based on unemployment mm -hmm. and not workforce participation and mm -hmm. regarding unemployment that we've got folks that just aren't looking and aren't interested in having a job? So your question is partly about the way the formula is, right? And, and you're correct. It, it uses poverty rates and unemployment rates, not labor force participation rates. So that may be a change you could suggest to some of our federal officials in terms of they're looking at reauthorizing that Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, and that may be the kind of change you would want to suggest to them. Representative Lawrence. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you guys for being here today. Um, first, I want to say that I fully support what you're working toward. Uh, I know that I've said in a room full of colleagues that since I was elected in 2020, we have all talked about how can we better serve our constituents, the businesses, the people that are looking for jobs. This is the answer. I truly believe that. I sat with our local director, which they're here. If you guys want to wave, thank you all for being here, Denise uh, and Amy. I, I sit here today as someone that has used the service in my early 20s when I was looking for a job. I went there. That's where I applied for that work. I um, actually got the job and then turned it down and kept doing what I was doing. So, you know, um, the time that I spent down there and the, the, the way that I looked at things, we are trying to be proactive in this and not reactive. So we're not able to catch the kids that are maybe falling through the cracks until it's already happened. And I know that our local workforce development people have a very good working relationship with our schools. Um, our superintendents, our principals are calling down there and saying, hey, can you help these people? And I sat with Denise the other day and she teared up as she talked about some of the students that she's not able to help because the money is so restricted coming from the federal government. And for that reason and many other reasons, I fully support this. And I think that this is our opportunity to put action into the words that we say. So thank you all for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Bratcher. Thank you, Chair. Just a couple questions, if I may. Um, one is you showed a slide up here that the uh, participation rate for people from 16 to 24 was at like 1%. One in seven were working. Where, where are they at? What are they doing? So this is one in seven who are not in school and not working. So that means six out of seven are in school or are working, which is great. That's where we want them when they're 16 to 24. But uh, we don't know much about what the others are doing. What I can tell you from the customers that come in is they're sometimes working off the books. They're sometimes not working at all. They're overcoming criminal backgrounds that are making it hard for them to find work. They're asking for help and advice about how to do that. Sometimes they've dropped out of high school and they're asking for help. Can you get me plugged back in so I can either get a degree or get a GED, right? Many of them are parents. So they're scrambling, they're working, they're, they're working for cash. They're doing anything they can to scramble, but it may not be captured in official statistics. But a lot of them are really just wandering and need guidance and need a caring adult to try to point them in the right direction. Over and over and over again, what our what Goodwill tells us and what we've seen from this, doing this work over the last 20 years is a lot of these young people just don't have the kind of caring family that's get, guiding them in the right direction. And once you can connect them to a caring adult, help them create a career plan, they can follow the steps to do to get their life back on the right track. But without that kind of advice and guidance, they're really wandering and don't know what to do. And oftentimes that leads them into doing the wrong thing. Thank you. And the other question I had was, um, how are the funds distributed? So you said there's several different area development districts across the state. So I'm in an area of Elizabethtown that's going to that probably the fastest growing due to the EV battery plant going in, fastest growing area. The infrastructure and the need for training uh, and using Elizabethtown Community College and some others to train people, we need some more dollars. So how is the how are the funds divided up is there more funding going to an area that's seeing more development or is it if you could explain a little bit about that so the formula doesn't 
work on where's the projected growth going to happen. It's basically once it goes from each from the federal government to each state, it goes by formulas that are based more on poverty rates and unemployment rates than anything else. And the same when it's divided up among the 10 areas in Kentucky. So it doesn't take into effect this area is going to grow. They need more resources. This is part of why we're here introducing ourselves to you all and getting you to see that we think in order for us to really do what you want us to do, we're going to need some kind of state investment to be able to do it too. The federal money is shrinking and just isn't functioning that way um, and is not going to allow us, as Representative Lawrence pointed out, uh, it just doesn't allow us to do some of the most obvious things you would think we should be doing as workforce people. Um, and that's part of what we're trying to highlight. It doesn't take into effect at all the kind of growth in E-Town that you're talking about. If, if Thank I'm, you. Go I'm, ahead. I'm sorry. If I may add, um, the federal dollars are very much attached to unemployment rate. And that does not take into account the assistance our employers need. You know, we're called to, to serve both job seekers and employers. And as our unemployment rate shrinks, our investment shrinks, but we're still expected to deliver a high level of service to our employers. And in this labor market, our employers need us more than any time in the recent past. So that's really put a strain on our ability to effectively serve employers. Appreciate your all's presentation. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Representative Cole Carney. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you all for being here and for the work that you do. I have three specific questions to ask just so I can understand some of the context um, that you all have presented this information in. Um, there's obviously a disconnect between the number of youth that you're able to serve and the number that are disconnected, one in seven. Um, and you have tied that to the federal formula and the shrinking monies because of that formula. So I want to understand that trend in, in one of the slides was across, I think, two decades of the federal money shrinking. Has the rate or the number of disconnected youth trended correlated, correlating to that? I mean, has it increased based on the shrinking funding? So the, what we know is the percentage of kids who are or young adults who have gotten disconnected really went up after COVID in, tw in 2020. Um, but you don't see that reflected in the, the way the chart looks. Um, and, and honestly, at the federal level, there just isn't a commitment to really invest in this kind of thing at the federal level. I think it's fair to say that a lot of congressional members would essentially stop funding this at the federal level if they could. The recent, when, as we're considering the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act, the, the Congressional, the House Committee that just considered the reauthorization of that law voted to eliminate the funding stream that serves those disconnected young adults. They didn't, they didn't vote to cut it, they voted to eliminate it. So at least at the Congress, at the federal level, there's open evidence that many members of Congress don't see this as a federal obligation. And I think part of what we're trying to do is alert you all to that because we know we know how to do good work and the need is quite s serious. And those young adults are exactly the people we ought to be plugging into the companies that are growing all across the Commonwealth. But without federal commitment, we're going to have to find some way to serve them or they're just going to keep wandering. That's really the reality. May I have follow up? Um, so I wanted to, in light of all of that, and in light of the fact that we should anticipate, I guess, all of that burden falling to the states, um, what is the plan? So if it's just funding, is the plan to continue the same methods of outreach, the same strategies for outreach to reach the youth? So uh, thank you for the question. We are working with a, uh, through a budget to go to the Budget and Appropriations Committee and talk to uh, the representatives there as well. Um, we realize we need more funding, and we are trying through grants and other avenues. But at this time, there's no other funding stream for us. And then last question, Chairman, sorry. Um, given all of that, um, are, are you going to be restricted? So if the state is able to and does fund the amount needed for you to continue the work successfully, are you restricted in terms of the formula that you can use, or can you then ch tie it to workforce participation as opposed to unemployment? So the beautiful thing is if you all choose to invest through us, part of what we want you to know is there are business members on all of our boards who guide the work, 
and we've already been in this young adult work for many years and we know how to do it. But we just need investment to be able to do it well. Depending on how you would choose to invest, you can make that money much more flexible than the federal money is. Um, and we already have existing programs that that money would flow right through to make them bigger, better, and better known um, than they are now. Well, just one of one example, the federal law doesn't allow us to advertise our services. So when people always say to me, well, how come I never hear about you? How come I... It's because the federal law explicitly in the black letter of the law doesn't allow us to tell you about our services <laughs> easily. They make it hard. So this is one of those things. The other thing that I think all of us want to alert you to is we would love to work with those high school seniors who are who we know are not going on to college and need some guidance and help. Every high school counselor, every principal knows kids. Man, I wish I could get some help to that kid. But at the moment, we're not doing that. And it's just it's it's a crazy thing not to be doing that and to wait for that young person to get out, struggle, right, and then hope they find our program that we can't tell you very much about. Thank you. Thank I you, would Jeremy. like to follow up to that. Um, many people refer to us as the unemployment office, and we need those brand ambassadors that say, no, this is your Kentucky Career Center. This is where you can get some help. So I think that is part of the misconception as well. All right, I'm going to jump in here for just a second, and I want to follow up on where I thought Representative Kolkarni's question was going. If you receive additional funding, uh, to to broaden your work or are you going to continue in the same pattern that you've been doing just broadening the current strategy or are you going to explore new strategies for reaching folks and I think that's uh, that's what I thought her question entailed that's something that I'm interested in knowing are you just going to expound on what you're what you're currently doing or do you have strategies in mind that you'd be implementing if you received additional state funding uh, for this program. Thanks for the question, Representative Weber. Um, our strategies are going to be very localized. So uh, we have the 10 local workforce investment boards. Um, I, I do believe that in some cases we will be able to scale up existing programs uh, to, uh, with less restrictive funds. We'll be able to serve more people uh, with the existing programs. Uh, but I also think there will be opportunity to create some new strategies uh, based on each local area's unique needs. Uh, so it's really kind of difficult to say uniformly what we'll do as a statewide because it's very, very much based locally on, on our unique regional needs. Thank you. I appreciate that response. Uh, Senator Boswell. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Uh, there was mention several times about the word college, and a lot of these young people, and I think you would agree, that uh, maybe they don't need to go to a four-year college. And, and so my question to you is, do you think we have adequate uh, vocational opportunities for you, this young people? What I see for the, a lot of people in this age group that aren't participating in the workforce, they're not properly trained in anything. They're not trained as heating and air conditioning people, uh, brick masons. There's a lot of uh, jobs in our current economy that are lacking and it seems like we need, we need to be spending more time tracking some of these young people into vocational training. Oh, I think we're all in agreement with that Senator Boswell. We all realize the need is there and we have more and more uh, students that would like to be able to go in those trades but the trades cost money for training too and sometimes they're not uh, able to afford that. So to answer your question yes we would definitely push them into trades anyone that was willing to go. Senator Funky Fromar. Yes, and, and I want to especially say good morning to uh, Corey. Thank you for being here from Northern Kentucky. And Denise and Amy, thank you for all the work that you're doing in Bracken County and in the Buffalo Trace region. It's, it's so needed. And when I think about the 77,000 that um, I want to know their names. You know, how can we know their names? Because if we knew their names, and in Northern Kentucky, there's about 5,800 uh, that are in need of our help. And in we know that referral-based uh, marketing is perhaps one of the best sources of marketing. And there are many good things happening. So part of what we have heard in the last um, six months, just in this interim, where all of us legislators are available to be free and talk with whomever we want, 
we're talking a lot about education and this commerce piece seems to be the most important aspect of the education process, but we're hearing that there's not enough time in the day to assess the curiosities of the kids. Assess whether they're learning something, but what about their curiosities? And I hear about some really interesting assessments that maybe you have access to and you could perhaps get into the middle schools um, so that these middle schoolers are once, again, great career paths that students can consider going into high school, but they, but they may not even know themselves that well. But I hear about some of these good assessments that maybe our uh, Workforce Investment Board has access to. Can you help us understand, and, and maybe some of this is a wish, but having those dollars, how could you get to our kids sooner, our 13-year-olds, our 12-year-olds, so that when they're hitting high school, they perhaps know that there's something to plug into instead of unplug and move on? Thanks for the question, Senator Funky Frohmeyer. Um, I 100% I agree. We need to reach our kids earlier, and middle school is really the time for career exploration. Uh, in Northern Kentucky, through a pretty big uh, collaborative uh, project called Growing Regional Outcomes Through Ro Workforce, GROW, and, and in partnership with an organization called Navigo, uh, we've been administering uh, what's called a youth science assessment. Uh, every high school in the state is required to do some type of career interest assessment, but the beautiful thing about the youth science assessment is that it, it measures interest and aptitude. So it really helps kids understand what they're good at, gives them, you know, optimism for the future. Um, so far, after doing this for two years, we've reached over 22,000 students who have taken that assessment. Um, and what we're finding is that, and in the, in the data can be compiled per school, what we're finding is that many female students in particular have high aptitude for STEM-related careers, but low interest. So what that tells us is we need to do a better job of intentionally having conversations, particularly with our female students, about what career opportunities may exist within the STEM field, because I think it's more of a matter of lack of awareness than anything else. And, and we are introducing this assessment to middle schools as well. Um, now, when the question comes back to cost, there is a cost for compiling the data and, and giving a comprehensive talent pipeline report. We've done one iteration of that report, and it cost $1,000 per school. Uh, so our first report was $17,000 because we had 17 schools participate. We anticipate the next report will be for 25 schools. Um, and that will tell employers where the opportunities are, even for connections to work-based learning opportunities within their company, for more for the high schools than the middle schools there. Thank you. Thank you. And th that's such a great answer. And in, in we were visiting with our superintendents on Monday, KASS hosted a gathering, and a number of the superintendents said, we really don't even have time in the day to take that great assessment and now sit one-to-one -one with a student and help take that information and create inspiration. <laughs> so it's, it's there, the information's there, the student was assessed, but who's got the time? Or candidly, the expertise, and I, and I do look out in the audience and see we have some business leaders and business owners in some ways I know I've volunteered my time in junior achievement and in a lot of other places back to the school. I think there's a lot of us um, business leaders and legislators that want to volunteer our time in that way because it's, it's not necessarily missing on the dollars. Sometimes it's missing on the delivery of the information to the student. The dollar's been spent, but the student is still not there. They're not inspired. They don't see an application to what came from that that might have been just a statement but uh, in, is that part of your efforts to collaborate volunteer uh, leaders I would say absolutely um, we love our schools our, our K through 12 system is doing an amazing job but capacity and resources are limited on on their end as well so what we've seen is that the majority of attention is given to the top 10 percent and the bottom 10 percent of the school and that middle 80 percent is, is left to, to kind of fend for themselves, so to speak. And oftentimes, 
wind up in that opportunity youth category, that 77,000 number after graduation. So what we hope to do is to be able to get into, meet and provide intensive coaching for those students before graduation to help lessen that number of opportunity youth and get kids onto a career pathway that makes sense for them. So, thanks. We have three folks in the queue. We're going to get to those three, and then we're going to uh, have to wrap discussion up and move on. Senator Howell. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I think in the last three uh, have covered everything that I had, so I'll move on. Oh, good deal. All right. Uh, Representative King did have a follow-up question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate your indulgence. Um, based on the Q&A we've had in the last few minutes, it, it brought this follow-up follow question to mind. Kentucky's Work Ready Scholarships, I was just working on that earlier this week. So uh, there is state funding, and, and we have shown that to be a priority in looking at the top six, seven uh, employment needs in our state. Does your group work with that group? And this gentleman just mentioned the talent pipeline, which brought to mind the Kentucky Chamber uh, initiative. Do you all work together or are we duplicating efforts in different silos? Thank you. So we all work with our community colleges and they do a great job. So you fund them partly through Kentucky Trains to, to provide incumbent worker training. So companies will come to us. I need help. We've got a new piece of equipment or we're trying to do a new process and we would love to train people. The, we refer them straight to our community college friends who can use those trains dollars to, to offset part of that cost and to provide what those companies need. That's a great thing. The Work Ready Scholarships are another great investment from the state, but they're not quite getting where we need them to um, because the community college start time is only twice a year, basically, August and January. So if someone comes into a career center in February and wants to try to reinvent themselves and get in, figure out a way to pay to go back to school, our federal money is shrinking so much most of us don't have job training scholarship money anymore. And they may have to wait six or more months before they can even start. And by then, their unemployment insurance benefits will have run out. So then, they got a, then they've got a real challenge about how to figure out how to get into school and pay for it and keep a roof over their head. So, And the Work Ready Scholarship money has been running out. So the good news is there's demand for it. The bad news is there's more demand than, than we've provided funding for so far. And I'm sure you're digging into those details more than we are. So we appreciate that. So yes, we work with them all the time. Um, and we appreciate what they do, and there's no duplication. The more they can do, the, the more they've got a funding stream to try to help people pay for the skills they need, the less we have to try to find scarce federal money to do it. Representative Lawrence. Thank you. <clears throat> so normally in committee meetings, I don't say a lot. And if I speak twice, I'm definitely excited about it. And I forgot to say earlier, I have several local employees and I wanted to give just a little testimony to what you guys do. Local employers can call in to our local district and they will create a program if there isn't one to help train employees to retain them. We had a local company getting ready to uh, upgrade some of their systems and they were maybe gonna have to move from my hometown, Maysville, because their tr workers weren't trained on this machinery and it was very expensive for them to get that training. The uh, workforce development group there in Maysville actually created a program to train them, um, found ways to fund for those employees to remain in there, to even help with some of the, um, their pay for that week or month, whatever the case may be. But the testimony is going on. I feel like we dump a lot of money into a lot of things, and we get slides that say, oh, here's the, here's the fruits of your, your labor. Well, this is something that I can physically see and touch, and I'm that kind of guy. I want to show me show me kind of guy. I don't want to see papers. I want to see actual people getting to retain their jobs. So I'm really excited about this, if you can't tell, because normally my attention span kind of fades out. But thank you guys for being here. I want to thank you all for being here today. Uh, I have served on this committee for 11 years, my entire time in the General Assembly. And the workforce issue has always been an item uh, on the agenda. When I first came here, uh, Senator Wilson would talk about the Bowling Green area, and they had between four and 5,000 jobs that they were unable to fill. I think now that number is up between eight to 9,000. We're going to hear a presentation uh, next 
uh, in, in uh, north of Bowling Green, where we're looking at probably another five to seven uh, thousand jobs that folks are going to be looking at where where do we find the employees uh, and folks to come in and work those jobs with policies enacted uh, by the Kentucky General Assembly in the last uh, six years and with fiscal responsibility we've been able to do quite a number of things in the area of of job creation and bringing jobs to the Commonwealth we still have the challenge of finding an available workforce uh, to fill these jobs and so I do want to say I appreciate you coming here today as we weigh where we invest state money uh, in programs uh, I will agree with representative Lawrence we have to invest in programs that have a proven track record. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think Senator Meredith, uh, I'm referring to a lot of senators today, uh, mm-hmm. Senator Meredith talks about a return on investment, and we have to see that. And mm-hmm. so I want to thank you all for coming here today as we weigh that and as we look at it. So I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you all. Yep. Thank you for the opportunity. Our next um Speaker will be Daniel London, who's the executive director of the Lincoln Trail Area Development District. Uh, The General Assembly, in a special session, appropriated funds for the Blue Oval Electric uh, Battery Plant in the Glendale area. Uh, That is a big project. They'll have a huge uh, economic impact on our region. I asked Mr. London to come today. Uh, and speak. Before we do that, I, and I lose a quorum, uh, I would like to ask for a motion to approve the minutes of the last meeting. Okay. Representative Lockett, Representative uh, Branscombe second. All those in favor say aye. aye. And opposed, no. The minutes are adopted. Uh, Daniel, at this, point, at this point, if you'll introduce yourself and uh, Senator Deneen for the record, uh, and then after you've done so, you all can begin your presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Daniel London, Lincoln Trail Area Development Des- District Executive Director. Senator Matt Deneen, uh, District 10. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, committee members, thank you for uh, making time to uh, hear our presentation today. Uh, as you all well know, Hardin County is the home of Blue Oval SK, the largest investment in Kentucky's history. And with that comes many challenges many opportunities as the last group presented uh, discussed workforce development um, we have turned over I think uh, every blade of grass and dirt in Hardin County to make room for Blue Oval SK the challenges that we face and the needs though go beyond just the workforce and the development that we see coming into the area the number of employees five to six thousand new employees what goes uh, without I guess a whole lot of fanfare is the infrastructure that is needed to support the workforce that is coming in to the Lincoln Trail area development region. Related to water lines, sewer lines, utilities, all of those things are vastly needed. And uh, that is why we're here today. Um, And with that, I will turn it over to uh, my friend who's done a wonderful job of bringing uh, many of the judge executives together uh, from the Lincoln Trail Area Development that will be uh, impacted by Blue Oval SK. So, Daniel London. Thank you, Senator. And I want to take a couple of personal moments, if I may, uh, Mr. Chairman, a little bit uh, liberty. First of all, thanking Senator Deneen for joining me today. He doubles as my bodyguard. Uh, so glad to have him uh, today and some of the groundwork that he has done, certainly with you, uh, Mr. Chairman, as well. Uh, I was texting Tommy Druin a moment ago. Today's a little surreal for me. Uh, As I look around the room, I have a classmate from Metcalf County High School and Tommy Druin, a college classmate uh, in Senator uh, Max Wise. We went to Campbellsville uh, University uh, together. He's older than I am, just want to make that uh, note. So he was a couple years ahead of me, but we had a few uh, classes together. Uh, Tommy, another side note, uh, Tommy and I also were going back and forth. He beat me in a speech contest. Uh, in high school. So I I have a little pressure on me today, uh, aside from the fact that we have a room full of uh, legislators. And certainly, Mr. Chairman, you and I have worked together a lot uh, over the years as well. And I certainly appreciate your dedication uh, to our region. And I certainly appreciate the representatives uh, in the room uh, from my area 
uh, Lincoln Trail, Representative King, certainly appreciate all that you're doing to, uh, to help us. You're on the front line. Representative Bratcher, the, uh, the same. Um, certainly appreciate you guys and uh, all you're doing. And Representative Brans Branscombe, a uh, quick uh, word to uh, personal connection with uh, your dad. He built a building for me about 20 years ago. Uh, please tell him it's still standing and doing well. So uh, certainly appreciate uh, appreciate that. With that, uh, we'll get started. The first thing I want to highlight, obviously, as uh, all of you are aware of, we have a lot of economic development occurring across the state of Kentucky. But Lincoln Trail Area Development District, of which I'm per obviously partial to, uh, is uh, um, entertaining a lot of that. And uh, Blue Oak West K is the shiny new penny um, in, uh, in Kentucky as it relates to that economic development. But there's other economic development occurring within our region and across the state. And I want to speak to that uh, quite a bit today. In addition, I can speak as uh, Senator Deneen uh, will affirm, I can speak on behalf of all of our elected officials in our region. We are in unison as we approach um, this challenge. Uh, but I want to make sure that one takeaway you do not have here today is the fact that anyone is complaining about this economic development. Uh, it is a, an opportunity that any community across this nation would absolutely kill for. They dream of this every day, and we have it in the Lincoln Trail Area Development District. As I often say, if I had a rich uncle that uh, left me a gold mine, it would be wonderful, but it would have challenges. And uh, with this economic development, obviously we have some challenges and we'll talk about some of that uh, today. But we are ready for the challenge. We're going to meet it. And uh, with your partnership, we will get there. So the first slide uh, today, just uh, outline uh, my three goals. Obviously I want to provide you an update, specifically Blue OSK. And then we're gonna drill down, I'm gonna start at the 30,000 foot level and then we're gonna drill down uh, to ground zero and exactly what we're dealing with all across, not just the Lincoln Trail Area Development District, but the one to the north of me in Kipta that you're a member of, uh, Representative Weber, Mr. Chairman, as well as the uh, Barron River uh, Area Development District and what we're seeing in that entire I-65 corridor because we're all going to be fishing from the same lake uh, when it comes to employment and uh, other needs. So I want to make sure I highlight, uh, highlight that piece. And then last, the projects that we're looking at uh, as a result of this economic growth and what we're all going to need in that, uh, in that regard. All right, what is Blue Old West K? Uh, we, we've all heard uh, the, uh, the acronym, a little news about it, but again, I want to dig down a little bit uh, as we start at this 30,000 foot level and give you a good, uh, good understanding. It's a $5.8 billion project, obviously not small. That number relates directly to the investment by the plant. Uh, this is a partnership between Ford and uh, SK Group, which is the second largest conglomerate in South Korea, uh, a very large uh, company. They are very involved in high tech, uh, the high tech industry, and they and Ford have um, uh, uh, joined in this as a joint venture uh, to build this uh, build this plant. So it's not solely owned by Ford. Again, this is a new partnership as they move forward. Uh, as you will see, I know down uh, uh, in Hopkinsville, I believe it was yesterday that SK. Um, the SK Group announced another economic development project there uh, as it relates to uh, battery recycling. So there's a lot of investment from that company uh, occurring across, uh, across our, our state and uh, region. Uh, the number of jobs, uh, 5,000. That relates, again, just directly to Blue OSK. Has, that number has nothing to do with the ancillary companies that will have come to the region and the state as a result of that. So again, when you see that 5,000, it's just related to that plant. We'll go into a little bit more detail um, in a moment, but uh, I'm, I'm an old Army planner, and whenever we, uh, general rule is whenever we sent 100,000 uh, soldiers to, uh, to fight, there was 100,000 soldiers that needed to support them. It runs pretty close to that in economic development, and you're going to see that number here in just, uh, just a moment. So we're gonna see a large influx, again, not just this plant, but all the ancillary across, uh, across the state. Uh, just to give you a perspective, and I know Representative King, you talked about uh, with the previous panel workforce participation quite a bit. Uh, the Lincoln Trail Area Development District has 280,000 roughly residents in that region. Roughly 180,000 of them are working. Uh, so that's a participation rate of about 57%, uh, which tracks the, the, the state 
uh, percentage that we have. Just the blue oval SK number at uh, 5,000 is 4 percent of those participating, that participating workforce. That's a pretty large impact and again we haven't even talked about the ancillary portion of that uh, yet. Uh, production of this plant which we'll talk about uh, here in a moment is 86 gigawatts uh, per year. Uh, that meant absolutely nothing to me when I saw that because I, I am not an electrician so I don't understand that but I have a slide later that we'll talk about that uh, in just a moment. Uh, this obviously is an historic investment, largest single investment uh, as the governor talks about in Kentucky ever and uh, again as I'll talk about in a moment the second largest is just to the south of us by an hour and uh, on I-65 so again a lot happening within that region. Next, I really want to communicate the size of this uh, because it is, it is absolutely monstrous. Now, Senator Deneen and I have the opportunity of seeing this almost daily, uh, so we get, to, uh, we get to absorb it a little bit and see it in its transformation. And uh, so I, I want to highlight this uh, a little bit uh, today. It's two plants, not one. Uh, obviously, they both will be performing the same, uh, same function. Uh, it's on the 15-acre mega site in Glendale that the state uh, purchased back in the early uh, 2000s. Uh, as many of you recall, as a result of their recruitment of Hyundai, which uh, did not uh, pan out, I, I will say today as a resident of Hardin County, we have turned out much better. And uh, the state has turned out much better as a result of that. Those two plants uh, total 8.4 million square feet uh, or 2.3 square miles. Uh, that is large, very large. Uh, world ranking, it's 10th in the, uh, in the world uh, in terms of sheer size. It's the largest EV battery facility in the world. Uh, so that is certainly something for our region and our state uh, to, uh, to brag about. And then national ranking, it's number two behind uh, Kia's West Point Georgia facility. Progress as of uh, August, um, again, wanted to uh, bring this to, uh, to the forefront just to have a good understanding uh, of exactly how much uh, building material has gone into this. Uh, I'll highlight uh, uh, right off, uh, they have 40 dirt hauling trucks on site, 15 excavators, 12 bulldozers, 9 cranes, and 30 full-time cement trucks. Uh, Chairman Weber, you and I had a conversation the other day when you went down I-65 just trying to comprehend the massiveness. The, uh, the closest I've ever seen in terms of that construction site was my backyard Tonka uh, playground. And uh, so this is every five-year-old's dream uh, to be able to uh, go to that site and, uh, and see this. It is absolutely enormous. It looks more like a cat dealership uh, than it does a, a construction site. Uh, but as you can see from the sli slide, they've moved uh, 7 million cubic yards of earth, uh, which is, it obviously is a lot of dirt. And I represent Branscombe. You probably a little more familiar with uh, th that amount than I am, but uh, obviously uh, very large. 2.8 million square feet of roofing, uh, 535,000 square feet of exterior siding, 257,000 cubic yards of concrete. They have, I know at least, uh, and I failed to get this number before I come, two full-time concrete plants on site, um, and we have more coming to the area. Uh, I believe there's two, if I remember right, uh, one in Elizabethtown, one in Hodgeville as far as concrete plant that's coming. So if you're having a hard time getting concrete in your region, you're going to have to come to Glendale to get it because that's, uh, that's where it's at. Uh, steel, 44,000 tons of steel, uh, which is a lot, and that's a small amount compared to what it's going to be by the time it's finished. Moving on to the next slide. Uh, pictures are always worth a thousand, uh, thousand words. The upper left uh, hand uh, picture is when they started, uh, shortly after they started in September 2022. Uh, the right hand picture is where they stand today. So as you can see, the uh, one plant to the left, which is referenced as Kentucky One, is mostly uh, complete from an exterior standpoint. And uh, we'll talk about this again in a slide uh, in a moment, but they're going to begin installing equipment in that plant uh, here in the next uh, 60 to uh, 90 days, probably a little bit uh, less than that. Uh, the plant to the right is Kentucky number two. Again, those are sister plants, same size, producing the uh, same, uh, same, same product. Uh, you can see the contractors have not wasted any time uh, at all. This has been an enormous, uh, enormous effort. The bottom picture is showing a rendition of what it will look like upon completion. You'll see the, see the two, uh, two plants side by side in the uh, distance there, uh, and then around that is the uh, electrical infrastructure uh, that will support uh, that plant. Uh, I have heard, I don't have this factually, but I'll throw this number out because it, it, it's been repeated enough, I think it's fact, uh, but they expect their um, uh, electric bill 
um, in uh, uh, per month to be between five and ten million dollars. Uh, so that's a lot of electricity that's going to be uh, consumed uh, at uh, at those two facilities. Uh, getting into the gigawatt uh, production, 86 uh, gigawatt uh, hours per year. Uh, Ford has not, or SK on uh, either one, have not talked about exactly what that production is going to be at that uh, at, at that plant. I presume that that's proprietary information. Uh, but uh, the Dallas Fed, through a couple of researchers, ha have produced an article just highlighting a little bit of what a gigawatt uh, looks like in terms of production. So I want to highlight that, which is the lower left. Uh, of um, of your slide, uh, particularly hone in uh, on the household per day. We're we're uh, averaging 30 kilowatts per hour of uh, daily use. Uh, 50 to 100 kilowatt, depending on size, and obviously they have different sizes. Uh, makes up an um, uh, an EV battery pack, and therefore one gigawatt hour factory is 10 to 20 thousand uh, EVs per uh, per year. So you can tell these two plants are going to have a very large capacity in turning out uh, EV battery packs and uh, as a result vehicles. All right, uh, moving on to the next slide, Blue Oil West K's economic impact, which is going to be uh, absolutely uh, huge. So we're gonna start at the, the, the left and then move over to the right and just talking about what that construction looks like uh, at this point in uh, the economic impact in, uh, in, in our region. As you can tell, uh, 720 uh, 20 workers, uh, almost 3,000 of those are traveling workers. I was a Hardin County government uh, prior to this job, and I'll tell you, when, when uh, this was announced, uh, Barton, uh, Mallow, and Gray were in our office saying, the first thing you need to do through planning and zoning is get more campgrounds. Uh, we are going to bring a lot of workers from across the nation. Uh, here they travel in, uh, in campgrounds, and uh, the community has answered the call. We have more campgrounds than we know what to do with at this point, uh, but they're all full. And so the economic impact has been uh, an enormous. Uh, 3,500 peak workers, uh, which is about where they're at right, uh, right now. Uh, and I think that number is, is actually a little bit uh, larger than that as they've, uh, reality has uh, somewhat uh, hit, uh, hit. 2,800 housing units for traveling workers. I will highlight, and again, Senator Deneen will, uh, and Representative Bratcher will, will affirm uh, this, Elizabethtown, Hardin County, Riddle Market was already stressed because of economic development within our, our region. Uh, I have the, the, the blessing of having some rental properties, as does Senator Deneen, and if you put, um, put one up for rent, you better be ready for a lot of phone calls. Uh, and that was before this uh, project was announced. And now, if you don't have at least in 24 hours, you're, you've done something. Uh, you've done something wrong. Uh, people are absolutely clamoring uh, for housing units. So it, it has been a bit of a challenge, and we're going to see more of that, which we'll highlight uh, here in a moment. 1.6 billion dollar construction uh, payroll, uh, 75 million dollars in local materials and services. That's just what's being uh, purchased on the uh, local uh, local market. Equipment install. I talked about that just uh, a moment uh, moment ago. Uh, they're in the process of beginning that uh, this uh, this quarter. Obviously, go into uh, to, to next quarter. So we're going to have uh, tax from uh, South Korea on site in uh, in the community. Workforce uh, that gives you a schedule of what it looks like in terms of what Blue Oval SK uh, intends to have on at uh, each one of those gates end of year, uh, with full capacity in the year 2025 at uh, 5,000 full time equivalents, uh, and the plant will be pretty much a 24/7. Uh, operation. Moving to the top right of, uh, uh, of the slide, average construction pay is uh, 50000 uh, 50, uh, To give you a little bit of perspective, the median wage for Hardin County runs about the mid-50s. Uh, in our LTAD region, uh, obviously some of the other rural counties bring this uh, average down a little bit. We're in the high 30s, so that gives you a little bit of a scale uh, that you see over our eight counties and 27 uh, cities. Um, then uh, uh, 8,000, 16 total jobs in the region that a recent study by the Ch Hardin County Chamber of Commerce predicts will be as a result of this, uh, of this plant. And uh, that, uh, uh, that number takes into account, obviously, the 5,000 at Blue Oval SK and then the supporting uh, of that. So you, you almost, went, again, when I refer referenced earlier that one-to-one, one one, we're not quite there. Uh, but uh, it's pretty pretty doggone close. That study also, moving to the next one in terms of uh, discussing people, is looking at, they did a comparison of boom towns across the nation. 
uh, in this study and then took, to, took a look at our region and the economic development that was going to occur. Uh, their prediction, which is actually on the low end of some analysts, uh, that uh, Elizabethtown Hardin County is going to gain 22,000 residents as a result of this by 2030. And so as you can imagine, uh, Elizabethtown right now ha is hanging right around the 32,000 uh, mark in terms of residents. So you're going to get uh, a near, uh, uh, it's about a 75% increase if my mental math uh, is right. That's an enormous drain obviously on services and infrastructure, which we'll talk about uh, here, uh, here in a moment goes back to workforce participation as we've talked about. Uh, we're all fishing again from the same lake in terms of uh, employees up and down the I-65 corridor. This is a national effort in terms of bringing people in to work at, at not just this plant, but all the economic development projects we're going to have. Uh, and as referenced by the previous panel, we're already in uh, middle schools and high schools trying to get uh, people queued in on these are STEM jobs. Uh, this is exactly what we've hoped for. This is exactly what you're studying for. Here's the opportunity. We need you. We need you to start thinking about this right now. And you don't necessarily, going back to one of the members' question, have to have a college degree uh, for, uh, for these jobs. A total, uh, uh, the last uh, point, total of 8,800 uh, new housing units are going to be needed in the, uh, in the area. Right now we have 4,000 just in the Elizabethtown city limits that is in various stages of planning or construction. And so according to this study, we're gonna need another uh, uh, almost 5,000 housing units. And again, as I referenced before, we were already uh, stressed a little bit uh, in, in, in that area. So um, developers are answering that call and building. Uh, we also, for the first time in history, have national builders like DR Horton in the, uh, in the area building as well. And so we're, we think we're gonna see a lot more of that. Uh, as a result, Elizabethtown can move up uh, to the fifth, uh, fifth largest city uh, as well. Uh, so I want to point, uh, point that out. Uh, there's going to be strain on the, uh, on the school system. They're predicting almost 4,000 more students and then 75 new hospital beds. And I uh, can tell you Baptist Health right now is the um, uh, primary caregiver in Hardin County. And they are working hard to really uh, get after this, uh, this issue and looking at their, uh, their plans over time, as is our school districts. Uh, they are on the front end of this. Uh, really uh, honing in on, on what, uh, uh, what is needed. Moving on to the next slide, uh, and this is where I want to move away from Blue Oval SK for a moment and really highlight uh, before we get into uh, uh, the shocker of this, uh, this presentation in the, uh, in, in the price tag of some of what we're looking at, uh, to give you a holistic picture of what we're looking at, not just in the LTAD region, but that I-65 corridor that you're going to hear us reference. I certainly don't want to offend uh, my Northern Kentucky uh, friends or uh, uh, Little War Lexington friends, but, you know, we talk about the Golden Triangle a lot. Uh, now, I wasn't real swift in, uh, in geometry, but we're going to stre stretch, uh, I'm not sure what shape this will end up being, but we're going to stretch that golden triangle uh, on down to uh, uh, Bowling Green with, uh, with this economic development. And that's going to be huge for the state. That's beneficial for all of us, because obviously the more people we have participating, more people we have paying taxes, uh, more production that we have, uh, that evens the, the, the tax burden and the burden of civilization out uh, across. So this is going to be obviously a good thing. Uh, in, in what we're seeing in terms of this economic development. Uh, New Core Steel, uh, about a year ago, opened up in uh, Meade County. That was a $1.7 billion investment and 400 jobs. Uh, that seems so small when you're talking about $5 billion investments and uh, $3 billion investments, which we'll talk about uh, here in a moment. Uh, but uh, obviously in our region, Meade County being right next door to Hardin County uh, was a very large uh, investment. Uh, bourbon industry, which obviously several of you in this uh, room are uh, invested uh, in, in this uh, through your representation. $2.1 billion in new investments and 700 jobs last year uh, alone, uh, which was record for the bourbon industry. Ms. King, you have a new one uh, in Washington County that's going to, uh, that was just announced. Uh, we have one in Hardin County that was just announced. That's going to continue to, uh, to grow. There are several others across the state that have been announced. Uh, so that industry is growing leaps and bounds which again is contributing to our economic development and our infrastructure needs. Uh, obviously, as many of you are aware, they all industry is large consumer of uh, wastewater and water, uh, but the bourbon industry particularly uh, is very large in that. So um, uh, that, that presents a little bit of a challenge for us uh, as well. The new battery plant uh, in uh, Bowling Green um, in Vision, 
Uh, they are another large, uh, large company based in uh, Japan, much like uh, SK On uh, and the SK Group. Uh, they have announced a $2 billion um, plant, a little more than $2 billion in uh, Bowling Green, uh, 2,000 jobs. Um, the Chamber of Commerce and uh, Warren County government recently said that uh, this is going to have a $20 billion impact over the next decade and $233 million annually in payroll. So again, uh, that's a very large economic uh, development project. That is the number two um, single investment in Kentucky behind the Glendale battery plant, Blue Oval SK. So as you can tell, uh, an hour apart, a little less than an hour apart, you have the two largest single investments ever made in Kentucky in terms of economic development. Uh, so that is uh, absolutely huge. That facility, to give you a little perspective uh, to the Blue Oval SK facility, uh, they are going to be 30 gigawatt uh, production. Uh, they see in the future uh, through their planning that that could go to 40 uh, gigawatt. So again, that's going to be a large capacity, about half of what uh, what Blue OSK is, but still very large. And their facility is going to be three million square feet. Uh, so again, that is not a small project uh, by no means. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, up in your area, obviously uh, UPS continues to grow. You also have Rivian, which is another EV battery uh, or EV uh, vehicle manufacturer. Uh, that continues to grow and invest in uh, in Bullitt County. Uh, obviously, that's the next county north of uh, of Hardin County. Uh, rumors uh, are abound that Rivian will continue to to, uh, to expand and uh, invest in Bullitt County. So again, we're going to see that I sixty five corridor from Louisville all the way down to uh, well, the Indiana line all the way down to the Tennessee line is going to be chock full of economic activity. Um, and uh, it, it's, it, it's going to be huge for the state and our region and, again, contribute to some of what we're going to ask for and what we're looking at in terms of our forward planning. Uh, the last slide I want to talk, uh, talk through, and I know there's a lot of material uh, here, and, and I won't go through this individually, um, but uh, this we have laid out uh, over the last uh, six months, and Senator Deneen and uh, Representative Bratcher have been very integral in, uh, in, in, this, uh, in this process and bringing everyone together. So this was actually started uh, before I came on board at uh, LTAD, uh, City of E-Town, and the mayors and judges got together and said, hey, we've got to start planning what this is going to look like, not just across our region, but again, up and down the I-65 corridor. So Jerry, uh, Judge Executive Jerry Summers, uh, Mr. Chairman in Bullock County, is very involved in that process. Uh, our Hart County Judge Executive from uh, the Brad region is very involved in this process. It is not limited to the Lincoln Trail Area Development District. In fact, Senator Neen and I are, are uh, uh, facilitating uh, a meeting today at 1 o'clock at uh, our LTAD uh, headquarters, which is going to be uh, a little bit of a wind down of exactly what you're looking at in this strategic plan and having everyone in the room to do the final sign off on all the planning and er effort that we've done over the nine, last nine months in what we see we really need to focus on over the next uh, six years. Uh, highlight uh, in this plan, and again, this is a summary sheet of our larger, uh, larger plan, the uh, um, water and sewer utilities, just uh, classifies utilities because that's going to include water, sewer, and gas. Just that needed infrastructure we need across the region up and down the I-65 corridor to land, I reference this as an economic tidal wave because it's exactly what it is. So to facilitate a soft landing of that, we're looking at a price tag of $534 million just on the utility side over the next uh, next six years. That does not take into account any of the other projects uh, that we have and needs going across uh, our region and the other regions um, because obviously, as you all know, there's great need out there for water, water and sewer. That $534 million is just directly related to what we see is needed for the economic development picture that I just outlined to you. Uh, in roads, we're looking at $217 million. Uh, so you can obviously quick math in that. We're just a little less. Uh, we're right around uh, $800 million in terms of what's needed in infrastructure uh, to, to success, successfully uh, engineer a soft landing uh, in, uh, with this economic development. Um, in closing, I appreciate, again, the opportunity to uh, uh, have this conversation with you. I look forward to any questions and certainly ways that we can partner and talk about how we make this successful for all of us uh, all across the state. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Senator Deneen, for being here and presenting. I wanted members of the committee to, uh, to get an, an uh, idea of the 
of the size and the scope uh, of the project. And as uh, Daniel pointed out, uh, not long ago I had the opportunity uh, while heading south on 65 to pass it in the uh, the, the scope of the project is, is a bit overwhelming just to see. Uh, I've never seen that many cranes in one place in my entire life. Um, I was told by some folks that were, were working in the concrete business that the demand for concrete in, in the construction we've seen so far actually was creating a concrete shortage in, in Kentucky. Uh, others that needed it couldn't find it because it was all being utilized. So I appreciate you coming here today and, and presenting, and I hope members uh, uh, have gotten a better idea of, of the, the scope uh, and the impact that the project um, will have uh, uh, on the South Central Kentucky region. We do have one question at this point, uh, Senator Mills, and then we'll get to Senator Thomas. Over here, guys. Sir, how are you? Thank you for your presentation. Uh, just you talked about being a a planner, a detailed planner, and thinking through things. Just a couple things I was curious to get your comments on. Uh, does it concern you uh, from a planning standpoint that only 35 percent of Americans are interested in buying an electric vehicle? And then the second question is, what occurs to these huge investments uh, if federal policy changes that's kind of driving uh, the electrification of our vehicles? Thank you, uh, Senator Mills, for uh, for that uh, that question. Um, I, we get this question a lot, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, Senator Mills, I, it's probably above my pay grade in uh, in, in talking to some of those uh, some of those issues. Uh, but uh, I, I will tell you, through extensive market research, what we're being told from Ford uh, is with, gosh, I'm, I'm going to date myself here. The newer generations, this is where uh, America is going, and in, in, in their desire for those electric uh, automobiles, so much so that Ford has bet their entire future on it, uh, which obviously is uh, is significant. Uh, I, and to your next question in terms of uh, really presidential leadership, I think is what you're what you're getting at. Obviously, we all know uh, politics can uh, can change on, uh, on 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 a dime. Um, I, I've often said, and this is an absolute personal opinion, uh, I want to stress that. Uh, being a Kentuckian, I wish we were talking about more uh, coal-fired plants and, uh, than, than, than solar and some of this, but uh, I, I, I think we're a little far down the road uh, at this point in terms of the electrical, uh, that the politics, uh, it, it make it very difficult to, uh, to turn around. Because let's face it, it's being driven largely by the private sector. Uh, so I, I, I personally don't see any impact of that, and certainly with Ford betting their future on it, uh, I assume they don't either. Senator Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Weber. I'm, I'm going to come at, come at my question from a different standpoint than Senator Mills. Uh, I'm just curious, have you had any kind of dialogue with the University of Louisville or West Kentucky regarding engineering and technology uh, as this project advances? You know, I know with UK, uh, you know, they, they have a, a very close relationship with Toyota with regard to to Sorry. working with, with their technology and engineering. So does uh, KCTCS uh, there in, in, in Georgetown. They've built an advanced manufacturing plan to assist with uh, uh, Toyota. So I was wondering whether you've had any, any um, uh, coordination or know of, of any kind of um, attempts to work together from both Western Kentucky University and U of L as this plant progresses and comes online. Sure. Yes to all of it. Uh, and so I'll, I'll highlight a little bit. Uh, uh, we as an LTAD, we recently sold our building uh, and moved and we sold that building to ECTC and their plan to use for it is an engineering school. And obviously, as you know, a two year college uh, doesn't have uh, a full four year engineering uh, program. Uh, we have a great leader and president in Dr. Justin Pate, who is as forward thinking uh, as anyone in the uh, in the nation. Uh, in my humble opinion. He is working tirelessly, and I'll be honest, uh, sir, we are taking a back seat to that because he is the one that is driving that train and frankly needs to in bringing all the schools together in their engineering knowledge. And his plan, and I know he has a number of um, uh, MOUs um, signed and ready to go now, is to turn our former building into an engineering school that's going to house all those programs so we have an on-site 
uh, in the area school that will produce these engineers. And they're already recruiting in middle school and high school to bring those uh, engineers in. You know, we've talked a lot about in our communities and, you know, Tommy Druin and I sit here as uh, Metcalf Countyans. We had to leave our county uh, to have op find opportunity. Uh, we now have the opportunity, not just in Hardin County, but the region that our sons, daughters, grandsons, granddaughters no longer have to leave our community uh, to find these STEM related jobs. It's the holy grail, uh, obviously, of STEM jobs. And we're really, really uh, laser focused on that, pushing it forward. And if I will, uh, if you, I would like to add, Western Kentucky um, has brought with it um, to Elizabethtown lots of entrepreneurial technology opportunities. And we see that ripple effect um, there are lots of um, incubators, if you will, of technology from payroll to um, workforce development, but there is just a great deal of technology, small technology companies that are coming into the Hardin County area and the Lincoln Trail area as a result of, of this development. Senator Boswell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, some of my questions were, uh, were uh, asked by Senator well, uh, Senator Mills. Uh, my concern, one of the concerns I have is, you know, there is a war on fossil fuels in our country right now, and Kentucky certainly is coming out on losing end of that, but we need to continue as we go into the future to make sure we're going to be able to provide this power, and that's, so that's my first question. This is, uh, that's a lot of power. I mean, this is, when I look at this project, I just have to say, wow. You know, that is a lot of power, so I hope that uh, as we go into the future, we're going to be able to provide power for these type of things. And the only other thing I'd say is one word, caution. I'm a businessman, and years ago, I uh, had a fairly large business. And uh, early in my career, I, I had one client that was huge, and they went out of business. And so I, I just I think just, we just, just a little bit of caution as we go into the future not to have too many eggs in one basket. To speak, uh, I appreciate that, uh, Senator, and, and speak that, to that um, uh, a little bit. We, we have, we're fortunate in Hardin County, and, and I think uh, the Altad region as a whole, we're, we have a pretty diverse economy. Uh, and obviously, this is going to be uh, a big, uh, uh, big role in the breadbasket, uh, so to speak. Uh, but we're fortunate to have Fort Knox. Um, a, I talked about New Core Steel. We're now bringing on um, a, a bourbon distillery. So we're very diverse, so that obviously helps in uh, quite, uh, quite a bit. Uh, to speak to the, the power issue, I know uh, in speaking to Congressman Guthrie's representatives last week, TVA has expressed uh, a concern about uh, their power generation and being able to facilitate more of these large projects uh, in, in Kentucky. So they're, they're nearing their, their allocation is my, my understanding. Uh, I don't believe that to be the case with LG&E and, and KU, which is supplying this plant uh, in, in a lot of the northern part of the I-65 corridor. I, to my knowledge, they have not expressed any concerns, but uh, TVA has. Um, you know, so, and it's not just, I don't want to focus just on electricity either, sir, because we, the city of Elizabethtown, I have to be careful what, what I say as a result of uh, uh, inside knowledge, but uh, the city of Elizabethtown is now in the position of having to turn away other economic development projects uh, that are very large because we lack the infrastructure uh, to be able to, uh, to support it. So uh, it, it's a number of these. Um, but I think that's a good problem to have uh, because people want to invest in Kentucky. And that's a great, uh, that's, that's not a bad thing. That's a, that, that's a blessing for all of us. Thank you. Representative Bratcher. Thank you, Mr. London, for being here. It's great to see you. And Senator Dean, it's good to see you, too. <laughs> but um, just if you think about this, the sewer, roads, bridges, electric, housing, hospitals, um, um, restaurants, trades and professional services, jails, daycares, vehicle sales, all this across the board is expanding in this one little community. So the infrastructure, we are limited by our sewer. We can't grow or expand anymore unless we have sewer facilities, water facilities, electric. So that's a huge, huge thing that we need to be aware of the other thing i want to talk about is that we you touch a little bit on was investment in people so we need the people the technology and the training to do uh to prepare these people for these high-tech type jobs and one of the best ways in the community to do that is through our community colleges i think that we sometimes undervalue the the 
and underfund the community college in general. And just to, and I, me, I'm, I'm an employee at Elizabethtown Community College in the economic development. And just to let you know, we have Blue Oval comes to our economic development workforce solution side and is asking for, can you put together a program that would train people on how to build this battery or how to engineer, think about the engineering side of building this battery in a clean room that we're going to have at this facility. So they're developing programs in college curriculum that doesn't yet exist in our college programs. So I think that um, if you think about investment in people to prepare people for these high tech and jobs, it's very important to, that we're aware of that, that we're not only investing in infrastructure, that we're preparing our students not only at the high school level, but at the community college level to be able to provide. So I appreciate your time. Thank you. Good. Senator Wheeler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I guess I would, a couple of the subsequent questions have touched on some comments, but you know, I, I think the presenter indicated that this is being driven by the private sector. I, I think very little of this is being driven by the private sector, although I'm, you know, I rejoice like all Kentuckians in the investment made in the community. Um, I think it's clear that the push for electrical vehicles is driven from the uh, federal government and, and, you know, I think potentially threatens to put the United States in a crisis as far as having adequate generation to, uh, to power these vehicles. But I guess one question I might have is, do you have any idea of what the average vehicle is going to cost that's going to be produced, uh, you know, utilizing the batteries in this plant? Sir, I, I, I do not. Uh, that hasn't been uh, information that's been provided to my knowledge. So you don't even know whether the average American is going to be able to afford one of these vehicles? I, I do not know that, sir. A brief follow-up. Um, where are most of the materials being sourced to produce these batteries coming from? Are they coming from the United States of America? Or are these... Uh, or will these materials be coming from China? I, I don't know the breakdown, sir. Uh, again, I haven't. Uh, that information hasn't been provided by the uh, by the company. We have been told that uh, they're going to source as much of that uh, onshore as possible due to obviously trade wars and concerns. But I, I don't have the breakdown of that, sir. Okay. D don't you think that these would be important things to know before we do uh, serious investment? I mean, clearly we've seen major American cities like Flint, like Detroit, that eventually have large investments become ghost towns due to various uh, poor planning in the long term, uh, some of which is a result of, of, of government overreach and regulation and other types of things. Uh, don't you think that we're going into this that we need to make sure we have a full picture of what this represents um, before we invest too much in something that may be very subject to the whims of political policy coming out of Washington. I can address some of those things, I, I believe. It's not whether or not um, it is coming. It is here. It is here now. The development is here. The need for infrastructure not only surrounding Blue Oval SK, but the multitude of factories, many of them um, such as uh, that are already currently in our industrial park, deal with not just electric or EV battery productions, but they also deal in truck parts that are combustible engines. The growth in Hardin County is not if, it is now. It is here, and this will be the driving force for our Commonwealth. We're bringing people in from out of state, not only to build it, but they will be moving here to the Commonwealth, and they will be taxpayers here in the Commonwealth, just alone for our schools. And the ripple effect that this factory has, it's five, six million dollars worth of investment in our schools on an annual basis. You have to understand that our hospitals, our roads, our schools, everything from education. We're actually meeting with middle schoolers now discussing advanced manufacturing opportunities. It's here. It's not a debate whether or not it's coming or it's not coming. It is here. and We have got to step forward and address the issues that feed our Commonwealth, and that is the people of our Commonwealth. These are the jobs that the people of the Commonwealth 
really need. They are high paying jobs. There are jobs, 5,000 of them alone in one factory. That's not to count the infra, all of the insulator factories. These are Kentuckians. These are jobs for our people. We need the infrastructure for the housing, for the sewer, for the water, for the emergency services. It's badly needed. It's a must. We can play politics on a national level, but Ford Blue Oval SK has invested in the Commonwealth. And I believe that we have to build around that investment for the people of our Commonwealth to move forward. If we want to talk about poverty levels and unemployment levels and all of those things that our state's been known for for years, this is our opportunity. This is the strike point. This is the tip of the spear. This is what brings other factories here. And you've seen it up and down I-65 corridor and beyond. I believe they're here in Kentucky because of the wealth of coal and infrastructure that's available, land that's available, opportunities that's available. So I implore you to look beyond the short term of politics and to look at the long term employment opportunities for the people of the Commonwealth. Representative Lockett. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Senator, uh, for those those remarks. Uh, I just had a couple of questions uh, and a statement. First of all, um, I've I drove down uh, like you, Mr. Chairman, a couple weeks ago, heading towards Nashville and past this behemoth uh, that's on the side of the road. And honestly, I probably caused a wreck because I slowed down just to look at it and just just to just to kind of take it in. I mean, kind of you know, looks like Six Flags being being. Um, being built there on the side of the road, but it's a, it's a super thing. Um, my, my question does, uh, revolve around electricity. And I know that you threw out some terms that I'm not familiar with in terms of the amount of power that is needed. Uh, you did mention, uh, that the power is coming from primarily LG and E and KU, are you familiar with where or or how that power is being produced currently that they will supply these these plants? So is it coal fired? Is it wind? Is it solar? Do you do you have that that knowledge? It's going to take all of it, uh, obviously, because uh, as you know, the the infrastructure in Kentucky for renewables is pretty uh, pretty slim uh, at this point. I don't want to speak for LGE. E, uh, LG&E and, and KU in terms of what that mix is, but I know it's Blue Oval SK's desire to have as much renewable energy as possible uh, that they're they're going to use. Their goal is to be zero uh, percent uh, carbon footprint right off uh, right off the bat. So I'm presuming most of this is going to be fed in some way by renewables. But again, I, sir, I, with all due respect, I don't want to speak for LG&E and KU. Sure. So so are they the primary drivers in terms of figuring out where the power is coming from or or does Ford have any input into that at all? Yeah, of course, uh, they, it was a purchase contract, uh, obviously, between Ford, LG&E and, and KU. So to break this down just a little bit further, that site was divided in terms of service between LG&E and KU uh, and Nolan Electric, which is EKPC, Eastern Kentucky Power Cooperative. Uh, no land and EKPC end up ceding that territory to LG and E and KU. Uh, I don't know all the specifics as to why that uh, why that occurred. Uh, I presume it part of it was because of capacity and split uh, split that, and then uh, EKPC and No Land took the everything else basically in that area uh, in order to to uh, ensure that proper service was provided to, uh, to them. Uh, so those discussions between Ford, lg &E, and KU obviously are occurring in terms of what their desires are and what they can supply, and I'm not privy to that, sir. Sure. One more question, too, Mr. Chairman. Um, one of the questions that I get, which I cannot answer um, uh, from constituents when, when they talk about EVs and talk about kind of going forward and so forth um, in this environment, there's all kinds of things online and so forth on social media that, that will say, you know, a battery replacement on a car is this much, you know, X amount of thousands of dollars. D 
Do you have any idea? I know the question was asked in terms of, of how much the car will cost. Do you have any idea how much just the battery that's produced by this this actual plant will cost on the open market? I do not, sir. They have not released that information, and much of this is still proprietary. Uh, obviously, as part of their uh, part of their agreement, and I'll go back and reference. This is a again a joint partnership between Ford and SK On, and so they're still filling out a lot of uh, their relationship and what things are going to uh, to look like. Uh, so their focus has been on construction, uh, building these partnerships to make sure that they have suppliers in place as well as uh, uh, workforce. So they haven't really gone into those details yet. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. All right, our final question is from Senator Funky Fromar. Thank you for sharing this. This is astounding. Uh, in particular, this last thir uh, thrust slide. <laughs> it, it is almost a uh, strategic plan that we could all take and apply to almost anything. When I've been in committee meetings um, over the last three days. We've spent a tremendous amount of discussion on the multiple billions of dollars that our Kentucky taxpayers, all those that are working so diligently uh, daily earning a wage, are putting towards those that aren't working daily earning a wage. So we're looking at huge Medicaid dollars that we're paying out, enormous unemployment dollars, just it, even the presenters just before you talking about 77,000 students uh, or people between the age of 16 and 24. Um, can you help uh, declare the process underway to reach around the Commonwealth of Kentucky and invite, draw, market, promote, reach out to those unemployed, underemployed, underskilled? Uh, because I love what you said about the president of the community college in that area that has a vision. But how do we get people from Newport and my Senate district to E-Town? Sure. Uh, and that's a great question, and I appreciate that. Um, I, I've heard this, this statistic uh, numerous times. I presume it to be a fact uh, that Toyota draws from over 80 counties at any given uh, time in terms of employment. Uh, I would argue that we're a little more centrally located than uh, Georgetown in terms of what we can pull from. Uh, so I fully expect us to be pulling again from the entire state uh, in addition to Tennessee, Indiana and those nearby states and nationwide. So it's all hands on deck. Uh, obviously, the friends and colleagues you see behind me in the workforce uh, community, we all are queued in. We collaborate closely. Uh, one of the questions uh, for the previous panel is how closely we work, uh, we work with chambers, uh, community colleges, et cetera. Uh, we are all dialed in on this, uh, on, on this issue, and we're working together uh, to recruit, get information out uh, all across through the chamber networks, through our workforce networks, and through KCTS uh, networks as well uh, to let everyone know that uh, we have this need, and recruiting has started in that. Uh, not only workforce boards from the uh, uh, LTAD region and others uh, were out recruiting. Blue Oval SK has their own recruiting team. Uh, they are going statewide at every career fair, every school event, whether it be middle school or high school that they can get into uh, to pull from these in addition to uh, college events um, in, uh, in, in recruiting. Uh, we're also looking at, hey, how can we look at this as a revival of sorts uh, of those who are underserved and underprivileged, whether they've had uh, a, a criminal issue, a drug issue, which obviously is huge. Uh, I'll give you a great example. Uh, our workforce board and the uh, Barron River, uh, or I'm uh, sorry, the uh, uh, Warren County Workforce Board just partnered and received a grant on someone dedicated solely to recruiting for the uh, EV battery uh, manufacturers in our area as well as uh, Bowling Green. And their primary focus is going to be underserved and underprivileged and folks that we can get on the right track. Going back to Senator Deneen's comment, this is a unique opportunity that we have. This opportunity from, from the Indiana, Kentucky border down to the Kentucky, Tennessee border, uh, all that economic development is an opportunity for us to right a lot of wrongs uh, in terms of our workforce and where people stand. Uh, we, we not only will be having people to come to Kentucky specifically to work here, uh, which obviously is a focus because we don't have enough people, uh, but we now have the unique opportunity that saying, hey, you've had a drug issue, we're going to get you rehabbed, but I'm sorry you don't have anywhere to work. We are now going to have those opportunities. 
Uh, and so I think this is a magical moment uh, for us to be able to pull all that together. And we are working fervently, ma'am, to make that uh, make that happen. And, and just thank you. A follow up to that. I was attending the Kentucky Manufacturers Association hosted at Gateway Community and Technical College. And I want to acknowledge that Senator Deneen is a shipbuilder. He's a relationship, partnership, friendship. He's a shipbuilder. And one of the outcomes from that meeting, there were five panelists that acknowledged they couldn't hire someone with a felony background. They wouldn't hire because they have federal contracts and they have other contracts that won't allow them. And there was some suggestion, well, then let's get their records expunged. I don't agree with that. I do believe that we as employers really care to walk in that recovery journey, but the recovery journey is a lifetime. And I would rather not expunge. I would rather be aware and partner and recognize and acknowledge. So that means company policies. That means encouraging these policies to be clearly established. Don't expunge past history. Know it, live it, acknowledge it, and you know walk on the journey with it. But and let's get them employed. Absolutely. And, and to that point, ma'am, uh, obviously, as you're aware, Senator Neen was a pretty previous uh, Elizabethtown City Council member, and city government as well as other governments uh, in our region are now taking a look at, hey, why are we not hiring someone just because they have a felony on their record? What is their story? What is their journey? And if they're at the right spot in that journey, we're going to hire them. City of Elizabethtown is taking a look at that now. Our employers in the area are taking a look at that. Uh, our jailer, Josh Lindblom, uh, started uh, a couple years ago providing employees from the detention center to factories and other businesses who have shown and demonstrated that they're on the road to recovery. And so that was a contract between the detention center and many of the employers uh, to get them inside uh, an employment environment, uh, teach them new skills, abilities, uh, responsibility, so that they have something when they return uh, to, uh, to, to, to the real world, so to speak. So it really has been all hands on deck in that, to, in, in to your, your, your point. And I would like to add to your, to your question about the importance of um, our um, community colleges and the workforce development. And I, I will steal a phrase from Dr. Pate at ECTC. This is a generational and transformational moment for Kentucky. We will see more first gen people attending workforce ready programs at our community colleges to be eligible for employment at these factories that are coming not only for this one, but for all the factories that are coming around it. This is transformational. This is going to move people out of poverty, off of welfare, and into high paying jobs. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity. So I wanna stress the importance of, of, please take a close look at the last slide and some of the um, um, funding that are is being requested. And that is of course, um, maybe not over one budget, but over the next several budgets. So please take a close look at that. Thank you. We're going to have one brief question from Senator Mills. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, this is this is in no way to put you guys on the hot seat, and you can choose not to even answer this question. But the discussion uh, that we've just had really brings another question to mind. Uh, so you said uh, LG&E and KU are going to supply power. You know, they are before the PSC requesting to shut down four coal power plants in the next three, you know, two to four years and replace it with gas and renewables. Uh, we know for a fact that this huge power need that you're going to have cannot be supplied with renewables. The type of power that it takes to run a factory, the consistency, the reliability that's necessary there uh, does not come from renewables. So I would just ask that if you haven't asked the question of KU and LG and E, how they plan to supply reliable energy, not only to SK, but <clears throat> we don't want to get put our whole Commonwealth in a situation like you find uh, E Town right now in water and sewer where we can't do anything because we have no power and we have no reliable power. So uh, please ask that question. 
uh, of uh, your power suppliers as you get together and plan some more. And uh, congratulations on the on the venture. It's awesome when you drive by it. I want to add my kudos to that. Best of luck. But uh, when you come before us and explain, a lot of us hadn't had much explanation about the plant, so it brings up questions like you're hearing today. And they're not to be, uh, we're not downplaying the uh, the size and the uh, the greatness that it could be for your community. So, but that is a concern of mine is that lg and &E and KU uh, will not have consistent, reliable energy, not only for SK, but for central part of Kentucky. Thank you, sir. We will ask that uh, question. If I may make one final uh, remark, and uh, Senator Neen talked about this a little bit in terms of the water and sewer uh, need, and I want to focus in a little bit on water. Uh, I, I know all of you hear this on a daily basis in terms of what the inter water infrastructure need is across the state. It is critical. It is absolutely critical. The aging of our systems are um, enormously understated. Uh, rates uh, have been a challenge in terms of being able to uh, produce uh, the amount of income to really keep up uh, and replace this infrastructure. Uh, so as you look at this issue across your state, just please keep in mind, we don't want, just like power, Mr. Mills, uh, we certainly don't want to uh, end up in a situation like the West is uh in in having water issues and and not because we're not getting enough rain but because we don't have the infrastructure to facilitate it i have counties now in my region that have water interruptions as a result of failing infrastructure uh and we're really looking at that as uh, being wide scale uh, wide scale across uh across the state if we don't do something thank you i want to thank you all for being here today senator mills question illustrates why we have this discussion today a lot of folks are not aware of, of the full magnitude of the project, the, the stress that it places on local communities to provide that infrastructure that's necessary uh, for this to happen. And that's why we have this discussion today, and that's why I asked Daniel to come and, and present on this, so that we can do what I believe was accomplished today, and that's where we vet this project, we ask questions, uh, look to the future, uh, and think about things that maybe previously had not been discussed or thought of. And so I appreciate the, uh, the dialogue and the uh, impact with the members of the committee today on this discussion. Uh, again, thank you for being here. That does conclude our agenda for today. We've passed the minutes. Do I have a motion to adjourn? We have a motion to adjourn.